Good morning, church. Merry Christmas. I, I, I would like to sincerely, sincerely wish you a Merry Christmas from, uh, on behalf of Pat and, and, and Emily and Will. So Merry Christmas to your families, and I trust that uh, it has been a, an, a, an incredible time of celebration as we celebrate the birth of Christ um, this, this weekend, and what a, what a time of joy it is. So welcome to church. It's cold, and so um, thank you for coming. Thank you for, for bittering the, this cold weather. And I mean, there's been times where, uh, you know, it gets cold like this, and I just want to sit at home for a while. And it's like, hey, we're not going out. But you know what? We live in Saskatchewan, and if we did that, we were going to be staying at home quite a bit. So thank you for coming out, because um, it's uh, just part of the way of life. Thank you to all of you joining online as well. I just checked that uh, just earlier, and uh, there's several of you viewing. Uh, several of you tell me that you watch regularly, and you're not able to attend for one reason or the another. So welcome. We do welcome you and appreciate you joining us as part of our church family. So thank you for that. Thank you to guests. If you're new here, thank you for coming. If you just come for Christmas, hey, we're glad you're here and are able to celebrate an incredible time with us. So thank you for joining us. Church family, it's always good to see you. And thank you for, for being faithful in your uh, coming together to worship corporately. It is great to see you. When I was growing up, one of the things that was really common and that's a long time ago, I realized, but one of the things that it was really common was that we would just pack up the car, and uh, by packing up, I mean, you know, all of us kids would jump in the, in the car, and we would go off, and we would just pop into somebody's house and go visit unexpectedly. It's just something we did, and I, I don't know how people responded to it, and people responded to, uh, even now, that's not something that we do regularly. So how do people respond when we just show up unexpectedly? I mean, some of us, we will go to the door and we see somebody maybe we haven't seen for a long time, and it's an unexpected visit, and we're like, yay, you're, come on in, and we welcome them in, we're joyful, we're excited to see them, and, uh, and, it, and it's not a big deal that they popped in unexpectedly, or, and maybe there's, the, you know, the next person that comes in, and, and we're not quite as enthusiastic, but like, hi, good to see you, come on in, and, and we invite them in, and we have a chat, and, and uh, we, have a, we have a good visit together. And then maybe you go to the door and somebody's come to your place unexpectedly and you look at them and you say, hey, it's been a long time. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, maybe not long enough, but, <laughs> but you kind of block the doorway and you start chatting and you maybe even make up some excuse why you're not going to invite them in. You know, we're busy, whatever. And so there's all kinds of ways that we respond to getting a visit. We've been looking at some of the responses, unexpected responses, uh, unexpected visits, unexpected things this Christmas season. And today, what I want to look at is I want to look at um, some unexpected responses at that first Christmas. There, there's lots, actually, as, as I've been going through this, and we've gone through some of them already. Um, one of the things is I realize that there, there's actually qu a, quite a lot of unexpected responses from various people throughout this, this time frame or the, this, this narrative of Christ's birth. But today we want to just focus on, on a couple of those, and we'll read from Matthew 2, 1 to 11. But before we get into our scripture this morning, I just invite you to uh, bow your heads and pray with me. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts as we celebrate and worship this incredible time of year where we celebrate Christ's birth. And Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus. And as we look at some of these unexpected responses, God, I pray that we too would examine how we respond to this good news of Jesus, how we would respond to this baby boy, this Messiah, the Redeemer, the Rescuer, coming to mankind to provide salvation. How do we respond? Teach us from your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we've been reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. 
Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw this star in this, so we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. See, those are, there's, there's some key phrases in here that grab my attention. We saw this star in the east and we have come to worship him. And let's keep reading in verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him, and gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what his, has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly called to the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for this child. And when you have found him, report to me, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And this is another one of those phrases that I picked out of here that really spoke to me this Christmas. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. And then again, opening their treasure they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Incredible. So we pick up the account after Jesus has been born. He's been born already, and some months have passed by. Some people believe that even up to two years, anywhere from a few months to two years, have elapsed from the time Jesus was born, and we don't know for sure, but we know that he isn't, they're still not in this little inn. That's not where they are. Uh, so he is, he has grown somewhat. And so the Magi arrive in Jerusalem, Jerusalem asking everyone that, that they come in contact with. They're asking everyone, where is this baby, this, this baby who has been born king of the Jews? And, and they are, they're searching. They, they have a, a mission. They have a goal in mind that where, where is this? And so they're just asking everybody. They, they're, they're not worried about hurting or offending because they're coming into a Jewish community. And they f- probably felt that these people, if anybody knows where the king of the Jews is going to be born, it's going to be these people. And so they come inquiring. And, and really, I believe they kind of stir up a, this incredible buzz in Jerusalem. Uh, what is he talking about? Where is this king? And maybe they had some thoughts about it themselves as well already. But where is, this, uh, where is this king that they're talking about? And so the whole town, this whole community is in a, in a buzz. They're talking about what these magi are talking about. They saw that, you, what do you mean you saw a star and you followed it? Like you've, you've come from a long ways. You're travelers. You're not Jewish people. And yet you've come. And so what's going on? And so you can imagine just the, 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 um, the, the intense emotion that's going on around Jerusalem in that time. And of course, Herod, he's the king of, the, of the Jerusalem in that time, and he's ruling over, and he's been trying to establish his kingdom. He's, he's afraid that he's going to lose his authority, and, and so he believes, in fact, that he is the king of the Jews. And so he hears this news, this buzz going on around town. What? Someone else is going to be the king? Who is it? What are we waiting for? And verse 3 tells us a little bit of how he responds to this news, to the visiting magi. And he is troubled. He is agitated. He's worked up. In fact, I think he gets worked up too into quite a fury over this whole thing. This whole news that may strip him. I mean, he's thinking the worst case scenario that this is going to strip him of his kingship. Where does this leave him? 
What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my rule, my authority, my, my kingship? And so Herod responds, and he responds with anger and hostility. You see, Herod was an incredibly jealous, insecure man. He was suspicious of anything and anyone. He had his own family members killed. He had, I believe he even had one of his wives killed. He was cruel. He was evil. He was, uh, we, we would say he's a maniac. He, he did some of the most horrific things to human beings that uh, of all time, he's incredibly, incredibly cruel. And, and so here's a guy that's incredibly insecure. He's trying to fight for his kingship, his authority over the area that he rules And now all that's being challenged. And so he's afraid there's going to be a coup attempt. There's going to be an uprising. The people are going to uh, fight against him to to get this new king into power. And so he secretly gets the jump on on everyone. And he deceives the magi with his intentions. He he meets with them and he's he's telling them, uh, report back to me. When you find this guy, like when did this happen? When did you see this? He wants some detail. Because he is really concerned about this king. He wants some detail about when he arrived, where he arrived, and where he is. And so he meets secretly with the Magi, and he tells him, you know what? Come back and let me know too, because I want to go worship this king as well. He knew the Magi's intentions, and and so he's trying to, I mean, he's deceiving them. Totally deceiving them. His intention never was to go worship this king. His intention was pretty cruel. And so the Magi leave, and later on as as they've left, God gives them a vision and warns them of Herod's intentions. You know, don't return back. Don't give Herod the baby's locations, and and so they don't. But when Herod realized the Magi weren't coming back, he becomes enraged, verse 16 tells us. He becomes absolutely enraged, and he sends his soldiers to kill all the male infants in Jerusalem, up to two years old. Do you see how horrific this guy is? How incredibly insecure he is? How incredible, like this is the type of man he is that, oh, if there's a kid born and he figures it out, the calculations when the Magi saw the star and when it's coming, and so if we kill all the kids two years and younger, we're going to get them, we're going to nail them, and this threat is going to be neutralized. It's not going to be an issue. Here we see Herod responding to the uni- to God of the universe, to Jesus, this Messiah, born to be the Savior of the world, with anger and hostility and rage. This baby was born to be the king of the Jews, but not only of the Jews, to be king, king of kings and lord of lords for all of mankind. He didn't recognize this baby boy came to change everything. For everyone, including Herod, if they would believe. And so instead of finding the peace, we sang of the peace of God that the peace brings because Jesus came. Instead of experiencing and finding the peace and joy and life in Christ, he was consumed with fear and anger and hostility. Herod and the, and the religious leader, I mean, the religious leaders, they kind of respond in, 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 in a similar way, but, but not to that extent at all. But later on, they sure do. But Herod and the religious leaders, they had one big thing in common. And that is this, that Jesus threatened their selfish interests. If he is king, where does that leave me? Where does that leave us as, as a king? First of all, here's the thing, where does that leave me as a king? The scribes and the, the, the high priests and the scribes, where does that leave us? We're these religious people. And if Jesus comes this Messiah, what's, what's going to happen? If he is the Messiah, what about our systems? What about our laws that we have in place? What about our, our status? You see, they respond in, with incredible hostility. Herod responds with incredible hostility and anger. 
And because this little infant, this little baby boy, well, now he's, you know, could be up to two years old, maybe one and a half. Well, I, we don't know. But he is threatened by this baby boy because he doesn't know how it's going to impact his selfish ambitions, his self-interests. And had the religious leaders known how Jesus' life and ministry would unfold, they probably would have wished that Herod hadn't succeeded in executing this boy, Jesus. Jesus' birth was met with anger and hostility by some, with others probably some uh, indifference. It didn't matter. But there were those who responded like the Magi, who responded to the news of the birth of Jesus the Rescuer with great joy. The Magi, these pagan non-Jewish travelers, they, they saw this star. I mean, think about this. You live a long ways away and you are somebody who watches the stars. You know the constellations. You know what is going on in the skies. But suddenly there is this miraculous thing, this, this new incredible star. And they follow this star. They're... They probably had a little bit of background. I mean, these people originated, the Magi originated from Babylon. And so if you remember back in, in the Old Testament, they would have been, um, they would have been uh, together in, in, in um, the, the Israelites would have been in exile at that time. And so the Magi, that's a, we're introduced to the Magi in, in Daniel, and, and we see them, uh, that they're existing together with the Jewish people. So they would have had a little bit of an under, understanding, an idea that there is a Messiah, rescuer coming. And then suddenly they see this bright thing in the sky. And, it, and it's something different. It's something extraordinary. It has to be something different. It has to be something extraordinary in order to get these guys off their bums and, and, and to travel this incredible distance. Some people say it took them months to get there because it was so far away. They drop absolutely absolutely everything. You're only going to do that if there's something miraculous, if there's something incredible that's taking place. And these guys, they believed it. These magi, they believed something incredible was taking place. And then really, you know, just thinking of the, they, they had so, the, the, all kinds of different beliefs mixed into their pagan religion. And it's these guys that respond unexpectedly to this incredible star. The Messiah is going to be born. They they're, respond to Jesus so differently than we would expect. I mean, they're inquisitive. They're inquiring with everybody. You know, they're going around, where is Jesus? You, 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 we're with the Jews. You'd think these guys would know, but they didn't know. So they go to the next guy. Hey, where is he? And they probably weren't quiet about it because they want to know. And I mean, Herod finds out too. Where is this king who was born... There's this baby who's going to be born king of the Jews. Why? This is what got me this year. Because we have come to worship him. We want to find Jesus for the very purpose of worshiping him. Not to be able to gossip. Not to be able to be the ones that saw him. Oh yes, we did see this great man. And we loved it. And now patch me up. They came to worship. Did you like that impression? I loved it. <laughs> That's how, that's how the Magi would have talked, I, I believe. <laughs> Sorry, distracted. But they came to worship, and I love that. That's their purpose. That's how they responded. They came from a pagan priestly line called Magi. They had risen to, these are guys that had been risen to a great place of prominence and consider, considered wise guys or wise men who studied the stars and knew it well. It's not, you know, they're not just your average stargazer. It's like, oh, it's beautiful. No, they were, they knew and they understood the story of the heavens. And they also responded with unexpected determination. These pagans had nothing to guide them but a bit of Old Testament prophecies. Nothing to guide them but their own science mingled in with some odd superstitions they picked up along the, the way. And when this incredible, miraculous sign appears, even with all of their misgivings and lack of understanding, 
they enthusiastically embark on an incredible journey to look for the king that was going to save people, including them. And they were looking for this king for the specific purpose of worship. They recognized something supernatural was happening. What is this star? What is this light that they've been following? So that's a great question, and I, I pondered that question this Christmas season. You see, when I come up to Christmas, often the last, I don't know, five, eight years, I've come up to Christmas, and I'm wondering, is there more to Christmas? And I'm not saying that these are bad. These are great. I love all of the aspects of Christmas. I love, that's a strong word. I enjoy <laughs> presents. I enjoy being together with family and friends. I enjoy the food. Absolutely. I enjoy all of those things. But there's been times where I come up to Christmas and I'm so absorbed in the, in the, in the, in the gatherings, in the food, in the, in the presents, that I forget to recognize what, what we're coming to do. Now, these magi, they didn't forget for a moment what they, they came to do. They came to worship. And so when I read this verse this year, it just stuck out. And I have been in a hard attitude of worship. We were coming to Christmas this year. I'm coming to worship. I'm coming to worship. Now, I saw the star, but I didn't see the star. I just, I just I heard the story in the Bible, and I have come to worship because it's an incredible story. But what is that star? What was it that was drawing them to Bethlehem? Well, I want to submit to you today that this star that they saw, that intrigued them enough to move them into action, had a significant meaning. And this star was none other than the glory of God revealed to these men, these magi. The star was the sign of the Son of Man, and it, had, and it is nothing more and nothing less than the Shekinah glory of God revealed in light, absolutely brilliant and dazzling light in the heavens. I'm going to bring you to, to, to Luke 2, 8 to 10, and to, to help as, as we're looking at this question of what was this star? What guided them? What prompted them? Because it's not just a normal star. I, don't, I, I find that hard to believe that it's just a normal part of constellations and it was a shooting star. It was, no, I don't believe that because this is the announcement. God is announcing the birth that took place from a virgin. That, that's a miracle in itself. So I think everything else is related to this miraculous revealing of the Messiah is incredibly miraculous. And so Luke 2, 8 to 10 says this, in the same region, so this is before Christ was born. This is before that baby was born. In the same region, there were shepherds staying out in the field and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord, what? Shone round them. And they were terribly frightened, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you great, good news of great joy, which will be for all people. What was it that was shining? It was the glory of the Lord. You know, if we go back into the Old Testament, we, we find that the glory of God is, man, is manifest in light. When God radiates his presence, he, ref sorry, he transforms it into inexpressible light. There was a star in the east and we followed it. The glory of the Lord brought them to worship. When the glory of God descended on the tabernacle in the Old Testament, it was what? In the form of light. When Moses went up into the mountain and he said, please show me your glory God hid him in a rock and showed him his glory manifest as light. And it was so much light that God on his face. And when he came down from the mountain and spoke to the people, his face was shining brilliantly. 
the glory of God is a shining light. And when Jesus revealed who he was and revealed his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, he pulled back the flesh and they beheld the glory as transparent light. So it's no surprise that these wise men, when they saw the glory of the Lord revealed in the east, it drew them. And it was no surprise that they responded sacrificially to this amazing revelation that Jesus Christ is born. They dropped absolutely everything. They traveled for months to find this king of the Jews. Not to mention what they brought with, the treasures that they brought with. And they were humble enough. They responded in humility. Humble enough to know when they were in the presence of God. And respond accordingly. That's how they respond when they come into the presence of God. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, when they saw the glory of the Lord revealed, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They haven't even gone in to see the king, but they've been led to the place. The glory of God is being revealed to them, and they come into this place, and they are worshiping. They are excited. They have great joy. They haven't even seen this king. In verse 11b, he says, And they fell to the ground and worshiped him. How do they respond? They respond in worship. Notice what their worship, their responding produces. They responded sacrificially and they responded generously. What do they bring? They opened their treasure. What they treasured, what they held dear. This wasn't just something, you know, you're packing your bags. Well, throw a couple of extra things because, you know, who knows what happens. You know, five extra pairs of socks, a couple extra pairs of underwear because you didn't ever want to be caught with under, you know, clean underwear. And so you packed it. This was different. They packed what treasure they had because they were going to worship this Jesus. And that's how they respond and they give their offering of worship. They're coming specifically, I want to give my best to this king. I want to give my absolute best to the king of kings and lord of lords. And so they come and they give everything that is dear to them to Jesus. Mary had a baby and everything changed for the magi. Everything changed. Mary had a baby. They see this brilliant light the glory of God revealed. And how do they respond? They drop everything. We're told if they have family or friends or anything, they drop everything for a land that they know little, maybe nothing about, maybe some, we don't know. They drop everything and they head out with their most precious treasures to bring and worship this king. Mary had a baby and it changed everything for them. Mary had a baby and it changed everything. And now we decorate a tree we buy gifts and visit family and friends, spend too much money, rack up our cards. Everything changed, right? Is that everything that changed because Mary had a baby? Mary had a baby. Everything changed. For those who believe, we can now be called children instead of enemies. We can experience peace instead of fear. Mary had a baby and everything changed. Mary had a baby. Did it change anything for you? As we come and celebrate this Christmas, What changed for you? What changed for you? Worship team, why don't you come on up? We want to respond in some, some worship this morning as well. But what changed for you? Does Jesus simply threaten 
the way that you spend your treasure? Does Jesus threaten the way that you spend your time, energy, resources, your, your dreams, your vision of what you want to be, what you want to be? Does Jesus threaten that? Do we come selfishly or are we have our own selfish interests in mind or at heart? Or are we greedy? How, you know, how are we responding? We have to respond. There's a, Jesus requires a response. Get alone with Jesus and either tell him that you don't want sin to die. Yeah, you heard, you heard me right. Get alone with Jesus and either tell him that you do not want sin to die out in you or else tell him that at all costs you want to be identified with his death. That's a heavy statement. To say that I want to be identified with Christ in his death at all costs. How are you responding to Jesus? Are you responding with extravagant generosity to family, friends, neighbors? And I'm not just talking generosity with your money. That's where our minds go all the time. But are we responding to the unsaved with generosity and spending time to get to know them, to love them? This is the very reason that Jesus came to, to earth to, as a baby boy, you know, going down the birth canal, crying like a baby, being hungry, suffering, going through what we go through, and yet without sin. But then he goes to the cross and he dies for us. How do we respond to that? Do we respond to that with worship? in adoration, bringing our best to him? How do we respond to our neighbors when they are in need? How do we respond with our time, energy, and resources? Think about these two people. One is a people group. One is the, the Magi and Herod. Do you respond to Jesus like Herod? Do you respond to Jesus like the Magi? Are you willing to drop everything? What, what does that mean? What does that mean for me to drop everything because this baby boy was born? It means that my self-interest, the things that, that I desire that are outside of God, my selfish interests, my selfish desires, surrender them to God. Your will, not mine. Your will, not mine. What about my time? You've heard me talk about it for a long time that I always speak of my time as so precious. This is my time. This is my day. No. Do we respond selflessly as the Magi? They drop everything to go and worship the king. How do we respond? They brought... This intrigues me. They brought their treasure. We're bringing our treasure. What do you hold valuable? What do you hold dear to you? What is it that consumes your mind and your thoughts? What do you treasure? What are some valuable things to you? Are you bringing it before Jesus in worship and adoration? Worship and adoration. Consider, consider how you respond to Jesus. Mary had a baby and it changed everything. What has it changed for you? What has it changed in your week? What has it changed in your day? What has changed in your life? If nothing has changed, Mary had a baby and it changed nothing. And that could be a sad reality if it changed nothing. It should change our hope for eternity. Let's pray. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you that Mary had a baby. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming as a baby. Oh, God, I pray today as people are responding to your word, to your call, that we could respond with worship, and that's what we want to do now. God, we respond with worshiping you because Mary had a baby and it changed everything. So, Lord, we lift up your name. We glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.